Alrighty, everybody. I'm sorry for the delays. Thank you for your patience. We have a full house today. Um, I'm excited to be here. My name is Tandy. You may also know me as the Automation Panda. You can follow me on Twitter at automationpanda.com. Uh, I don't need to tell you a whole lot about myself other than the fact that I love testing and automation. What I show you today is what I do on a daily basis at my day job. I don't do it in Python in my day job, but I still do these basic things. Language doesn't matter. Today we have a very, very full cool schedule and it just got chopped off by about 15 minutes. So we're going to have to move a little bit faster and we may spill over. But anything that we don't get to, all these slides are online. They're in that GitHub repository, so you can get it later. And of course, you can always reach out to me at automationpanda or at automationpanda.com. <coughs> so just quickly off the bat, I'd like to take a quick survey to see who is in the room. Please raise your hand if you're a developer. Nice. Any testers in the house? Manual or automated or both? Yes. <laughs> Any data scientists? Well, cool, awesome, welcome. Any other roles? Professional services. Yeah. Lost stuff. Okay. Analyst. Very nice, very nice. Well, welcome everybody. So, if you're here today, I'm assuming you want to learn how to do web UI test automation. Is that true? Yeah, awesome. That's my life. I love it. Now, Web UI testing can be hard, right? If anybody's played around with selling web driver on their own or trying to do some stuff, it can be a bit hefty. But today, we're here to make that easy by the power of Python. We have two hours minus about 15 minutes. So we're going to try to cover as much as we can in as little time as possible. In this time that we have, we're going to write one test case. It's going to be a basic web search. Now you may think, well, one test case ain't that much. How are we going to trust me? We're going to go top to bottom, step by step, deep, deep learning here, not like data science deep learning, but us as students, we're going to learn awesome things. So let's get to it. <clears throat> Here's our agenda for today. Uh, the way this uh, tutorial is going to play out, there's going to be a lot of me going blah, 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 sharing knowledge and information and best practices. And they're going to flip the tables, and you're going to have hands-on coding time. Now, most of the code I'm going to have given to you in that example project. Uh, but it's still good for you to read through that, write or type through it, and make it happen on your own machine. It's like a starting point. I'm expecting that everyone here probably doesn't have any testing or automation experience much yet. If you do, that's a bonus. If you don't, that's totally cool. The starting point here is just, you know some Python, and that's good enough. So we're going to learn a little bit about what web UI testing is. We're going to write our first test together. We're going to look at these things called page objects. Ooh, big buzzword. Uh, we're going to actually hook up Selenium WebDriver to make this thing real. We're going to use WebDriver to make the calls, such as clicking and scraping text. Uh, if we have time, at the end of this tutorial, we'll have a few little tidbits for how you can improve the solution on your own, as well as um, an independent assignment you can optionally choose as a homework for yourself to go along and write more tests based on what we've done here. Any questions so far? Is good? I love it. Cool. So I sent out instructions previously uh, saying, here is a GitHub repository with all the example code, as well as the starting point for our projects. Uh, if you haven't already, please clone that repo. And in the readme, there are setup steps. Uh, you'll need to set up a few things. Uh, I'm assuming everybody already has Git on their machine. Uh, please install that. Uh, I'm assuming we're working with Python 3.6 or higher. You got like 3.5, it's probably not going to make a difference. Um, but also, uh, I'm going to use pipmb as our environment management. You'll, I'll be showing how to use Google Chrome as the browser, so make sure you have the latest version of that, as well as the Chrome driver. Uh, you will need this if you want to ultimately run the automated tests. Yes? Can we just download it and get it on The project? Uh, theoretically. I don't see why you couldn't download it as a zip and then just kind of copy and paste. Um, that's, that works too, if you don't have Git over it. It's, it's just basically this, what's in this repo is just like a directory of stuff that you will need that has Python stuff in it. Right. So uh, if you haven't already, please take some time during the, the opening here, just get all this set up because by the time we roll into it, we don't have a lot of time together. Uh, we're just going to roll with the code. <coughs> and also, the way you verify that you've got everything set up correctly, once you get the, the project set up, you do a quick PyTest run, you'll see one little example test that does nothing passes. And you'll see green, and that's how you know, hey, I set this up right. So let's 
So let's talk about web UI testing. How would y'all define testing? Anybody? What does testing mean? Verifying code. Verifying code. Does what it's supposed to do. Functions as supposed to. Anybody else? Pass and fail. Great. Awesome. I think that pretty well covers it, right? Testing is a practice in which we identify goodness and or validate goodness and identify badness in the software code that we've developed, right? <coughs> we have whole disciplines around this. You can get a job as a software tester or as a software engineer in test, as I am, down in Cary, North Carolina. Um, <coughs> testing, though, has a bunch of different ways to do it, a bunch of different styles, a bunch of different techniques, a bunch of buzzwords, right? And what I hate doing is playing buzzword bingo. So I wanted to find some terms so that we're all on the same page as we're talking about what testing is and what we're trying to achieve with WebUI testing. So, first of all, off the bat, I'm going to say there are two primary different types of testing here, right? There's testing code, and there's testing features. When we test code, you may have heard of things like unit tests, right, or white box tests. When I'm testing code, I'm making sure that the code, be it in Python, Java, C Sharp, whatever language I have, is, is working to the way I expect it to be based on how I work. It's very much Testing is going to be interacting directly with the code I called, maybe calling those methods or those functions and putting in different classifications of inputs and verifying expected outputs. Um, unit testing falls under this category or uh, sub subcutaneous testing, if you've heard of that, so like chain unit tests together kind of. Um, but the idea is that we're verifying that individual units of code are working correctly. Right. And that's typically where most developers feel most comfortable with their testing skills. But that is a bit different than feature testing. Feature testing doesn't cover necessarily code, but rather what the code is built into, which are products and features, right? It is black box. The idea is that you've built some sort of software artifact and you're delivering it to an end user. Feature testing is how that end user is going to be interacting. That's how you're testing it. So you're not necessarily testing that your string <laughs> format function works, but rather you're making sure your logs are appearing on your web page. That's the difference between function or between feature and code testing. So inherently, feature testing is going to be black box. We expect the actual thing to be out there and to have some sort of interaction driven to it. Um, our integration level testing and end-to-end -end level testing, that would all be what we call feature testing. We're trying to verify that the live product features work correctly in a business sense, right? If I were to go to a non-technical person and say, hey, this is what I'm giving you, here's the value add for the thing I've developed, right? Feature testing is going to make sure that they're getting what they need. You may have also heard of the testing pyramid. Does anybody know about this? Yes, no, maybe? Cool, I know. Yeah. Yep, yep. So the testing pyramid is this construct where we try to break out the different types or levels of testing, right? Where our white box code testing unit tests kind of form the basis of our testing strategy because the closer we are to the code that we write, the, the more likely we are to catch bugs early. But we still have these upper layers as we go up the pyramid for integration and end to end that are going to be more black box, that are going to be feature level testing. And these are going to be, like I said, but not necessarily verifying the code does what we intended, but rather that the, the feature works as expected, especially when we integrate parts together and we have a full web application or a full microservice framework, right? Not just a little tiny class or we shape this as a pyramid because the higher up you go on this pyramid, the more costly it is to write these tests. Unit tests are easy, right? Anybody can write unit tests. There's a, a there were two PyTest talks earlier today. I went to one of them. It was great. <clears throat> but and most developers, like I said, feel comfortable down here. But once you start getting up into feature land and black box land, now you have to worry about things like, oh, I need to deploy the thing to some sort of test environment. I need to make sure it's set up with the data or the databases or maybe I have to mock some things out in order to have it live enough for me to test, right? I have to worry about race conditions because not only do I have the system that is my test automation operating, but I have the other system in the wild just kind of running through its thing, right? So you have many more concerns to handle. It's much more complex. And the chances of these things breaking is higher than in the tests. Uh, they take a lot longer to run, so you're paying more for compute resources. Uh, in fact, 
but unit tests will take, there's a rule of ones here. Unit tests will take about one millisecond to run. Integration tests will take about one second to run, right, make the call comes back. Web UI tests, which we'll be doing today, order of magnitude, each one will take about a minute to run. Because you have to wait for the browser to come up, you probably have to log into your app, you have to wait for it to load. It gets very slow, right? Slow is bad. <laughs> we like fast things, right? And it's not uncommon for industry grade test automation suites or web UI tests to literally take hours if you don't run them in parallel. Like, this is the scale we're dealing with. Hours is bad. We like continuous testing. So, but there's whole other talks we could have about that. But this is generally kind of like a, a right sizing. If you're going about how and where should I automate my tests, try to push down this pyramid as much as possible. Right? But we still need to make sure we cover our bases all the time. Cool. <coughs> now there is one misconception that I found. That it's, it happens in many communities, and I've seen it in the Python community, unfortunately. And that is that some folks, whether it's a misnomer or a Freudian slip, kind of assume that unit testing covers all types of testing. That's not good, right? And I'm not crazy because I found an instance very publicly where this was shown in force. And did anybody take the Python developer survey in 2018? First of all, I'm not here to criticize this. I think this is a wonderful thing and I want to keep I want to see um, JetBrains and the Python Software Foundation Foundation keep doing this. But in 2018 they had a question about testing frameworks. And when I got to this part when I took the survey, I was like, oh boy, it's included. Yes, my thing. Boom. And I read the paragraph and the results. The leading Unit testing framework. Testing frameworks equals unit testing frameworks. We left out a whole field of functional testing here and it broke up. Because this is that, that sort of misnomer to think that, oh, all testing is going to be unit testing. But that's not the case. Right? There are other kinds of higher level tests. And that was, this partially was kind of the impetus for this tutorial, this talk I'm having today. Because I want people to be more aware of the importance of feature level testing, black box testing. <coughs> and not just think that just because they have a type checker or because they do some unit tests means that their code is going to, or their product is going to be totally fine. Right? Testing strategy needs to cover multiple bases to mitigate the most risk. This is the frustration I feel from this. <laughs> like, oh! Uh. So let's drill into web UI testing specifically. So web UI testing is a black box type of testing of a web application through a real live browser. Right? The idea is like if you're a user and you, I don't know, you go to Google and you type in something, you go to Facebook and log in, right? You as a user are interacting with a real browser. Web UI testing, ideally, you're going to be simulating a user like that. Just one who's a lot faster. <laughs> and who does the same things over and over again to verify the features. It is feature testing because it tests the app like a user would, right? It is also end-to-end -end because all the parts of that web application are being exercised together. It's, web UI testing is driven through the, the main front-end interface, but ultimately in order to verify that everything's working together as it should, you're, you're inherently hitting all layers of that stack. You've got the front end that displays the browser, the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript. But you also have, most likely, the service layer, right? Because as you're interacting with things on the front end, they're going to be making calls to the back end. You have this persistence layer of any sort of data that you've got. Um, you've probably got web servers and load balancers back there, making sure everything's good if it's decided we'll have. Uh, you may have queues and workers for having your jobs, right? The user doesn't know any of this. The user knows, hey, somebody liked my tweet. Cool. Right? So while web UI testing may seem like it's entirely at the, the front end level, you know, all this stuff needs to be there too. And if some of these aren't working, that's going to explode spectacularly. And if there are problems, that's what we're trying to work on. So this has pros and cons. Web UI testing is not a simple bullet. It's not the perfect kind of testing. I'm not saying skip unit tests, do nothing but web UI tests. Not in the slightest. There are advantages that we should be aware of, and there are limitations. So some of the good things are that we will have end-to-end -end coverage. We will be testing like a user. We will have very visible results. And we'll be able to catch obvious problems, right? Oh, the thing doesn't look. Oops. Or, oh, every time I switch a page, it immediately kicks me out of my session. Oops. Those are things that we'll catch very well. Um, the challenges with web UI testing are that, first of all, it's much more complex to automate for the reasons that we discussed. It's also very slow. It can be prone to flakiness but not always. This is usually more a problem of 
implementing a test well versus the problem tool or the nature of the testing. But moreover, root cause analysis is hard because with web UI testing, we're, we're getting much farther away from the code base, right? So if we did a string formatting over, right, that's something that we really should have unit test for to cover so we can catch up really quick. By the time that escalates up to the full web application, we may not even have a test for something like that, <laughs> right? It could be something that slips through. Or if we did have a test for it, it would take much, much, much longer to pull up the app, log in, and get to the page to see something formatted poorly rather than a split second, you know, functional check from a unit test. Keep those things in mind. So then what makes a good web UI test? A good web UI test is going to focus on one main behavior. Right? And I like this term behavior. If you're familiar with behavior <laughs> development, I love it. Well, we can talk about that later. But one test should focus on one main thing. Right? So if that test fails, you know exactly the one main thing that is the problem. Right? Our test should be clear step-by-step -step procedures. Most of these tests are going to be multi-step. It's not a simple call a function and verify the result. There's going to be multiple steps. Logging in, navigating to this page, clicking this button, filling this field, validating this, moving on. So make sure, we want to make sure that whatever procedure we write is going to be sensible and clear, right? So the next person can understand it. Uh, as we said, it covers an important, not just one main behavior, but also that it's an important core feature. <coughs> Right. If you think about modern web applications, many of them are, are very sizable. Right? The combinatorics on the possible test cases we could have is huge. Right? It, you, could spend, you could send a huge team at it for a very long time and they still never have quote unquote complete coverage. You have to be picky and choosing. You have to decide what is most important to test. What are the key things that if it blows up, people are going to be in trouble? <laughs> Those are the kinds of things we want to cover with web UI testing. So be, be picky and choosing. Um, typically, this might mean you stick to happy paths, right? Basic user um, interaction through a system. Or maybe some basic error cases. We're not trying to get the very, very rare cases that happen once a year for one person who doesn't pay you any money, right? You want to get things where it's like if this is down, the whole thing is broken and things are on fire, right? You also want to avoid redundant, pointless, or unimportant variations, right? For example, we're going to be doing a search test, right? We could search for any type of animal. Right? Do we need to have 12 different tests for different types of animals? Maybe not. <laughs> Why? Because maybe the different types of animals don't really give us much variation in our search results. And so maybe we should save the time instead of having 12 minutes of testing just to one because we're trying to cover as much ground a short amount of time we have. And also make sure that your tests can't be covered by a lower level. Always start at the bottom of the pyramid and move up. Ask yourself, could this be a unit test? Could this be an integration test? Okay, well, maybe it needs to be an integration test. Let this check. If the test fails, will people panic? If the test fails, will people panic? If the answer is yes, write a test. If the answer is no, maybe you shouldn't write a test. Just quick, quick way to check yourself before you and also, will they know it broke? That gets more to the value that your test adds. If you write a test and it fails, is it clear to show, hey, this is the thing that broke, or is it gonna be buried in some logs and kind of muddled and confusing for the person receiving that? So, since web UI testing is expensive, we want to focus on return on investment. I wanna automate the most valuable tests. I wanna automate tests for things that are gonna matter most to my end users, or the things that are the most volatile, or the things that could cause the most damage or wreck the most havoc, right? I'm not gonna worry about low return on investment because I literally do not have all the time in the world to test. <laughs> Though you could spend the time doing yes, question. We do a lot of uh starting with our recent integration testing. Mm -hmm. Automated integration. Mm -hmm. We're just stupid things that take time. Mm -hmm. And we're leaving the more complex ones mm -hmm. for personal. Mm -hmm. Because they're just a pain in the butt. So. Exactly. Exactly. If if you have some scenarios that require lots of extra setup, or that take a long time, or that are just really really complicated, right? Those be, might be things like you said. You might want to leave those for manual testers. You know, do do the things, automate the things that make sense to automate. Right. Definitely. Definitely. Right. Because it, like I said, you you don't have time to test everything, and even less, you don't have time to automate all the tests. Right, try to, if you put a goal that says, we're going to have 100% test automation, 
run away from that team or that company because they don't know what the heck the strategy is. <laughs> right? You're gonna you're gonna drive the company into the ground for the sake of metrics. And I can rant about that, but that's not what we're here to rant about. Focus on ROI, right? It's a risk-based approach. Do the best you can with what you've got. <coughs> so today we're going to implement the basic test automation solution. And here are going to be the basic parts of that solution. Now, I'm very, very careful to use the word solution, right? A lot of people, when they say testing automation, they might say testing framework, right? I don't like the word framework. I think it's confused, right? High test is a framework. Unit test is a framework. So then what are we actually building if we build our own framework? We no, <laughs> right? We are building a solution. We are building a solution to a problem. The problem is I need to be able to run my tests much more quickly and at the push of a button very fast because I need that fast feedback in case something screws up in the code or in the feature, right? And I want that feedback to happen at the push of a button. That's why I audit it. And so my solution is to come up with tests, and I'm going to use things like core frameworks. I'm going to use Python, or today we're going to use Python as our programming language for our solution. Uh, we are going to use PyTest as our core test framework. The core test framework <coughs> is going to line up all of our tests, <coughs> run them, and they give us a pass or fail. For our UI interactions with the browser, we're going to, or for modeling UI interactions, we're going to use a design pattern called the page object pattern. Now, you may or may not have heard of this. We'll get to this around one of the later points in our agenda. But note that we are using design patterns here, just like any other domain of software development. Why? Test automation is software development. You apply the same rules, principles, practices to this domain as you would to other domains. Test automation is code, it's software. We develop it like software. And finally, we're going to use a tool called Selenium WebDriver for doing the actual browser automation. Our page object calls are going to be internally using Selenium WebDriver. And that's what's going to wake up Chrome and send it clicks and scrape text. So, this seemed good to everybody so far. Cool, cool, everybody's with me. Awesome. So, if you were to visualize kind of what this looks like for our solution. We're going to write our tests as functions in PyTest, where every function is a test case. The PyTest functions are going to call page object methods. Page object methods are going to make Selenium WebDriver calls, which have those native WebDriver bindings in Python. And that's, this is all Python code that we're going to write. What happens is when, when you make the Python library calls to Selenium WebDriver, it'll go to the WebDriver executable that's installed on your machine. I'm assuming everybody's got Chrome Driver installed by now on their path, right? Chrome Driver is a web driver executable. The bindings <coughs> will call out to that executable. Every browser type has a different one. So for example, Chrome Driver for Chrome, IE Driver for IE, Gecko Driver for Firefox. But the web driver bindings are all the same. So there's that abstraction. Same web driver bindings goes to whatever kind of browser you've got. And that thing is what's going to act as a proxy server between the automation code and the browser itself. And what's really cool is when you hit run to run your test, we're going to see that browser magically pops up and does dances on your screen and then closes down and you get tested fast or fail. That's what we are doing with this type of web UI test image. This is what's going to happen today, assuming we get there. <laughs> cool. Now, you may stop and ask, well, hey, Andy, this is really cool, but I'm a Django developer, right? And Django has some really awesome testing tools. Why don't I just use Django's tools for testing? And I would say, that would be awesome. You can do that. And in fact, Django's tools are excellent, and you should use that for unit testing. <laughs> the Django tools don't really handle feature testing. right? And furthermore, the Django tools only work with Django. What I'm showing you today can do feature testing in real browsers against any web app. Right? So keep that in mind. The, 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 the solution we'll be building can hit any web app. Why? Because it can hit anything that's loaded in a browser. So this, what we're looking at is a little more universal than just some testing for some particular framework. <coughs> Another question you might ask is, okay, well, Andy, I know there are these companies that make all these sort of testing tools, and they're codeless tools. I don't even need to do any code. I can just go into the tool and kind of write locators for my test case, and it automatically runs them and all that. Why would I need to develop my own solution using something like Python? And code, what I would say to that is codeless tools, they're pretty cool, right? They're great for manual testers who don't do development or don't know how to do programming. But you're going to pay a lot of money for them. 
right? You're going to have uh, these tests are not going to be very customizable, right? You have to put them into whatever interface or tool that you're using. Uh, in my personal experience, I found them often to be slow and clunky. And also, you now have vendor locking, which none of these things are particularly desirable in my opinion. My recommendation is if you've got a team with some programming skills, typically coded solutions, if you can dedicate the time and people to it, are going to be a much better alternative in the long run than codeless solutions. Right? You're going to have more fine-tuned control over it. You're going to be able to treat it like software. Um, and you're going to get much more power and much more speed and reliability out of it. So that's why we're here today to learn about this. Any questions so far? <coughs> so let's write our first test together. You all ready for this? Cool. Before we write a test, we have to plan the test. So hands off the keyboards, everybody. What we're going to test today is the DuckDuckGo web application. Now, I'm pretty sure everybody knows DuckDuckGo is basically Google minus other concerns. <laughs> right? But it works the same. You type in a phrase, and you get some results. And that's cool. And then you can go click those results and go learn about stuff in the world. Um, why are we using DuckDuckGo? First of all, it's for the available. I didn't have to make a web app that we go pretend to test. This is out there in the wild. It's pretty accessible. Uh, it's web UI is very simple. Right? We're not doing complicated stuff here. Just keep it as simple as we can. And everybody knows how to use a search engine. I don't have to explain how this works. You see it, you're like, oh, yeah. Great. So right now, everybody, what I would like you to do, go to DuckDuckGo.com and do some search. Search for something. <clears throat> so who wants to tell me what they searched for? Anybody? Greg, what did you search for? Test. You searched for test. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Young man right here, what did you search for? Something. Something. Wow, awesome. Great. Anybody else search for uh, something else? More interesting? Uh, Momo Gar. Sorry, I got to it. Momo. 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 Space. Gar. G H A R. What is that? The Dublin place. It sounds great. It's really good. What did you search for? <laughs> cool. Awesome. So, what were the steps you took in order to do the search? What was step one? Go to the website. What was the address? Cool, so first step, load duckduckgo.com. Second step, what do we do? Type in a search phrase. We typed in a search phrase in this bar. Third step, hit enter. Fourth step, read the results. Now, how did you know you got the right results? How were you able to assert? We don't know we got the right results. We know we got results that matched our thing, but what were the right results? So we can say matching is good enough. So. Okay. Well, how did you know that the results matched? What did you look at? The words we typed came on the top. So we saw the words we typed come up right at the top, right? We saw some of the links probably had the same words or related things to it, right? So not only did we take actions, but we had to validate certain conditions, right? We had to make assertions on it. Now, we didn't know exactly what the links would be, but we could know if we scanned through them and they're all dealing with Momogar and dumpling places and related restaurants, we know, okay, this, this seems reasonable, right? Cool. So, <clears throat> the reason why we do this is because it is very, very important that we write our test steps before we write test code. We want to separate our test case from our test code because those are two separate concerns. A test case is an abstract idea of the thing I want to exercise and validate. The test code is simply an implementation in order to exercise that behavior and give you a passive test result. If you jump into code too quick, you're going to find out your tests are crap. True story? Who has lived this? I have lived this. That life sucks. <laughs> test cases and test code are related but separate concerns. Write your test cases before you write your test code. Thankfully, because this was a fairly simple behavior, we're all on the same page. We didn't have to have a three amigos meeting where we pow out and figure out what the behavior is first, but everybody knows something. But typically, on a team, you may have to sit with the product owner or the developer and the tester together to figure out, hey, this is what we're doing. <coughs> so when we write our basic search test together, we're going to, we as the team are going to 
come up with a set of steps that are going to be in this procedure for this basic search test. Right? First of all, as we said here, step one, navigate to the browser. Easy. All in the same page. Step two, we're going to enter the search terms. We're going to assume, yeah, hit enter as part of that step. And then third, there are some things we're going to verify. We're going to verify the query in the title, as the gentleman back there said. Right? We can also verify that the search phrase is still in the search bar. I didn't magically disappear. We can also look at words in the elements, or words in the links. Make sure, okay, if they match the search phrase, maybe some expression or some sort of thing, then we can say, okay, good, this somewhat matches. Now remember, this behavior we're saying is just a basic search test. I'm not trying to go very, very deep into specific things. I'm not trying to you know, set exactly what the results are gonna be because they may change over time. Um, I'm not trying to verify too many other things like are there images or are the paragraphs here. Those would be other behaviors, therefore other test cases. We want to focus on one thing. And just run with the sake of this example because we want a simple test for the sake of our tutorial. So, um, so I'm guessing we're all on the same page with this test. It's fairly basic. I'm probably talking too much about very basic things. So let's write the steps for our first test case. I like to write my tests with Gherkin. It's a behavior-driven format, given when then. Um, it's very similar if you've also heard of a range active search, but there's special keywords with Gherkin. Um, I can talk more about BDD some other time. Just go with it. This is, this is how I write my tests. So, scenario, basic DuckDuckGo search. Given the DuckDuckGo homepage is displayed, when the user searches for Panda, then the search result title contains Panda. I don't and the search result query is panda, and the search result link is pertain to panda. One line per step, right? We have setup, action, verification, right? And this, this is basically all we need, right? Hmm. In basic plain language, I could take this test scenario to anybody here at Ohio and take down the hall, put it in front of them and say, hey, tell me what's going on here. And they'll read it and say, oh, you're doing basic search. And it would be, make intuitive sense. That's how we want to be able to write our test cases. It doesn't matter how complex the system or test is. If we can't explain it in plain language to common sense people, then either the test has been written poorly or the feature has been designed poorly. Simple is better than complex. Complex is better than complicated. So keep that in mind as a bigger picture of quality. So then what do we do once we have our basic English-y plain language description of our test? No, there's no code here. What do we do with this? Let's shove it into PyTest. Has anybody used PyTest before? Any first timers? Okay, uh, have you used other test frameworks? Maybe like unit test or J like unit. Yeah, JUnit, okay, cool, cool. And you, any test framework at all? Oh, you're a brand spanking new. Oh man, it's gonna be easy, this is gonna be great. Everybody help this poor guy out, that was good. You're, you're among friends here. This is a safe space. We're here to learn. It's awesome. I'm glad you're here. I'm so excited you're learning about testing. Cool. <coughs> so PyTest is an awesome test framework. I love PyTest. Of any test framework in any language, and I've used many, I like PyTest the best. Why? Because it is powerful yet simple. Right? You can write very concise tests where the framework gets out of your way. Right? Right here. This test function, test underscore, that is a valid test. It is that simple. You don't need to shove it into a class format. You don't need a whole bunch of extra setup and cleanup. Right? If you need that, you can use fixtures. It's awesome. And so today, I'm not going to be teaching about PyTest. We're simply going to be using PyTest. And it's going to be simple enough that I promise you all will pick it up pretty well. Um, if you want to learn more about PyTest, I can recommend some books. Um, Brian has written the classic Python testing with PyTest, great book. Uh, Bruno, one of the core maintainers of PyTest, has also written a quick start guide. I've read both of these books in their entirety. They are awesome. These guys are awesome. So great, great resources if you want to get hands-on, dirty, really learning your framework. Um, also earlier today, uh, Dane gave a talk about um, adoptive PyTest. Great, easy introduction to PyTest as well. I recommend it. If you didn't see that, go watch it afterwards. <coughs> And of course, the docs, when they're not down, are really good too. <laughs> they went down earlier this week. But I think they're back up now. Um, cool. So, 
If you were to open up the, the test project that you've downloaded from Git, uh, you'll notice that there is a test folder in there. And in there, there is a module that starts with test underscore, it's FW for framework. And here, in there, I have a very basic test. It does nothing, it just asserts true. Um, as part of the setup steps, you probably ran this test and saw it passed, which meant, hey, your PyTest installation is working. Awesome, great. But this is basically the format that our tests will go in, right? You, you can play around with the naming convention and the, the directory layout and all, but this is kind of like the standard out of the box, this is what works and this is what people expect, right? Tests directory is not a module, or it's not a package, there's no dunder init file. Um, module starting with the name test underscore, and then test functions with the name test underscore, right? With this, PyTest will automatically discover what those tests are, line them up like dominoes, and knock them down, right? Run through a pass out, pass out, pass out, boom. And if you run your tests, ultimately, you'll see something like this. Uh, since we're using pipmb as our package manager, you'll see you'll use the pipmb run command to run the PyTest test. You'll say python test and pytest. That'll discover all of them from that root directory that you're in. And it'll line them up, and hopefully you see a lot of green dots and a message like everything. If something failed, it will puke. <laughs> and it'll be very clear about why it puked. It'll give you the whole reason. I love that. Nothing's good. <coughs> so, let's get hands on now. First exercise uh, if you go, if you all have your projects open, go to the tutorial instructions in the readme. There are four parts in there. Let's do part one. It's going to be very simple. All you're doing is adding comments. But take this time to make sure that your project is set up, make sure you can run that example test, and then copy over our steps into a stubbed PyTest test function that will be added. Uh, if you need it, the repository link is here, as well as a, a short bit.ly link. <coughs> and uh, have at it. I'll check in in a few minutes to make sure everybody's got it done. <coughs> and feel free to ask questions during this time, too.
Python and the woman's name is in this, is this, this uh, Python. At the first slide, I never saw that before. Oh, um, in the, the code you Before, mean? yeah, before the dot string. Oh, 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 in the, in the readme class. Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. They're like backwards tickets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so in uh, a readme, if you're hosting that a project in GitHub and you're, you're reading, you want to format your readme in markdown, oh. the, 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 the slash or the, the tick, tick, tick backwards, three in a row, to know the code block. And then I know it works in GitHub, I don't know about others. If you put the name of the programming language, it'll automatically format the syntax out of the oh. So since this is Python code, I did tick, 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 Python. And then it gives you the nice pretty colors when you read it in the web. Okay. Yeah. Oh, if you're reading it from the, the, the yeah. D oh, file directly, yeah. that might make it a yeah. little yeah. weird. Try to read it with the format. Yeah. I didn't think of that, I'm sorry. Is everybody doing okay? Does anybody need more time? <coughs> Or we just need to type that scenario. Basically, yeah, just copying it over, getting your test function um, into a new Python test module, and then run it to make sure it's still no longer. Well, this time it will no longer fail. And then removing the old one. So, how many people have successfully completed it? Okay, so just a few more, you need some more time? I'll give another one. I'll also mention in the examples branches, all of the completed code is there. So if, if you miss something or happen to fall behind, worst case scenario, you will have working code for every state and you can go back. All right, so let's let's move on to the next one. Uh, at this point, after doing that, you should probably see something like this. <coughs> I'm using Visual Studio Code as my editor. High Charm, Notepad Plus Plus, all those of you other good choices. But we want what we want to see is to have a test a test search test module under the tests folder, and just have the basic um, template, so you will. I like to write my code like this, like I said, because I want to write my test case before my test code, and so I will stub it out so that I know when I go to program, I have all my steps ready to go and lined up. Um, we're adding this exception here at the bottom just to make sure that we're make sure this test fails until we complete it, right? Because it's not done until it's done. And if we were to run this, we would see the exception puked out saying incomplete. <coughs> also, we've removed that test underscore FW module because we no longer need that because we're working on a real test now. <coughs> so let's talk about page objects. What is a page object? Has anybody heard this term before? Raise your hand. Is this new? I know Rick, Rick is my buddy. He's a QA person like me, <laughs> or a tester, software engineering type person. Is awesome. So a page object is an object representing a web page or component. Fairly straightforward, right? It has a, two major things. It'll have locators for trying to find elements on the page. And it'll also have interaction methods that interact with the page objects, right? So if we think about, let's say, I don't know, that DuckDuckGo homepage, right? Um, there was a search page, there was an element for the search bar, there was an element for clicking to search, right? On the results page, there were link elements, a, one, a best practice whenever we're interacting with these web pages is to model our interactions somehow with automation code, right? And a basic, low-tech, easy way to get started without much overhead is the page object model. I can specify a class such as the search page, and I can put in the locators for all those elements and methods such as load and search. 
<coughs> and that gets me up and going so that I can make page object calls at a much higher level and then in the page object calls worry about my low level clicking and all that kind of stuff. So each web page component under test should have a page object class. <coughs> page objects encapsulate low level selenium and driver calls, which we'll get to. And that way, tests can make short, readable calls instead of complicated ones, right? I like going top down. So I like having my test steps, and then the next step would be, let me define what my page object call should be. Things like search page.load, adult page give me all the links. For our basic test, how many pages do we have? Two. It's OK to shout out. We're among friends here. We have two pages, right? Uh, we have a search page and a results page. This is a pretty easy test, right? Sometimes tests may only have one page. Well, that's good. So what do we do on the search page, right? Two main things. We have to load the page, and we have to perform a search. Well, on the results page, there are three things we have to do. And not so much three things that we have to do, but rather three pieces of, the, three pieces of information we have to get. We have to get the result count, the search query, and the title, right? Because we use those in our assertions. Everybody with me? So these are all things that, like, these are all interactions with the page. The user is doing something or getting something. <coughs> so I can stub out page object classes based on my needs, right? Go back, right? We said, OK, well, I have my pages and I have my things I need. Bam, Python. <laughs> so easy. It's right. Boom, it's easy. Source out of these here, right? So my search page is just a class, right? And I had two methods, a load method. Not a search method. Uh, my search method, or my load method, doesn't need to take anything in, right? It should know where to find them and go. But my search phrase, what phrase am I going to search for? My phrase is probably not something I want to hard code because maybe I have other tests that want to search for other phrases because I want to exercise other behaviors. So I'll parameterize them. The idea of this method should be I pass in the search phrase, and this method will know magically how to search and click. Right. I'm going to use pass for now just to kind of show a no op because I want these to be stubs. What we're going to fill in in the next lesson is what those selenium web driver calls would be to actually do the stuff. My results page, I have three methods as well. I have a method that gets the result count for a phrase. What this would be is to say, hey, go to my, my page and tell me how many of those links actually contained my search phrase. What I'm going to say for my assertion is going to be, OK, well, as long as I get some links that match my search phrase, I'm going to plant the flag and call victory, right? Because that's a good, good enough check to know that my, my results were somewhat good, right? I'm also going to get the search input value, right? Whereas the search test will send a value into that field, this test is going to retrieve whatever value is already in that field because I want to make sure that it's still the same search query. And also, we said we want to get the title. So I want to return whatever the title is. Here, I'm giving dummy values just as placeholders. Now that I have my page objects defined, I can go back to that test case that we wrote and kind of go to each of those steps and make the page object calls. Right? I already have them stubbed out, so I know what my interface is going to be with that. They're not implemented yet, but at least I can, like I said, go top down, and I can go one step deeper. So, for that first given step, given the duck.go homepage is displayed, what do I want to do? Well, I want to construct the page object. I want to initialize it because I need that object. And then I'm going to make a load call. Say, hey, page object got loaded. And later, I'll implement the search page to actually do the loading of that page. For my when step, when the user searches for panda, search page dot search for whatever my phrase is. Here, I'm hard coding it. That's OK, because it's the test variation. Right? It's just the input for this particular test search phrase that I want to use. Does this make sense with everybody? Right? It's it is, it's almost seems like, wow, this is this simple? Yes. It was hard. We're making it simple. Yes. Good design patterns. Boom! <laughs> cool. So let's have some hands on time again. Go back to your instructions. Well, let's do part two. This time, take about eight minutes. There's a bit more reading to do. And make sure you do the reading, because there's a little bit more I explain in there as to why the choices we made are the way they are. And copy the code over, make sure it's all linting right, parsing right, all that good stuff. And just give me a thumbs up when you've got that good.
everybody doing well? Does anybody need more time? Yes? A few more minutes. Does that make sense? Yeah, I agree with what you said, but still. for everybody, remember when you run the PyTest command, always run it from the root directory of the project. Don't run it from the tests directory, run it from the project directory. Right, because if you, whatever directory you run it from, PyTest is going to do a discovery of the test directory and the test modules. So, yes? So why do we create those pages? The website is already there. The pages don't represent the website. The pages represent our model of the website. Because what we're going to do is we need to interact with that website, and we're going to interact with that website through page objects. So the next activity we're going to do is we're going to actually write, well, yeah. we're going to set up something like that, but then after that, sorry, before that activity, is going to be we're going to code the clicks and the send keys and the scraping text, and that's going to go in the pages. So that instead of having to write like three or four slang calls for every little pain or action we want to do, we can say, hey, uh, search page search, and it'll take care of all those things. That's what those pages are. Yep. All right, so we are at time. Uh, is everybody able to get the test running and failing? Great. Cool. Let's move on. So uh, what we should see is something like this. I know the, the text is probably not the most visible on the screen, and it's tiny and it's black, but we should have our test search, and it should be flushed out now with all the different test steps fully implemented. Uh, the only thing missing is, of course, the implementation of the page objects themselves. But what you saw as you were writing your, or as you were um, writing this code in there, right, 
with the page object stub, not only can we kind of describe what those interactions are now and piece them together, but you'll notice that the assertions we were able to write as well. Right? We always want to separate our assertions. Right? We, we, our assertions should always be in our test functions. We should not be writing assertions in other classes or other libraries, and especially not page objects, right? because we want that separation of the concerns. But once we have you know, assertions here, you know, we can make our page object calls and make assertions based on these things. So cool. <coughs> so let's talk about setting up Selenium WebDriver itself. As I said before, Selenium WebDriver is the tool that's actually going to do the browser automation for us. We're going to call it from our PyTest test, specifically from the page objects, right? And that's going to go wake up the browser, send the clicks, scrape the text, and all that marvelous business. In Python, uh, the Selenium package is the Selenium WebDriver implementation. Right? There are other implementations in other languages. Uh, Java, C Sharp, Ruby, those would be the other big ones, JavaScript. They all have Selenium WebDriver implementations. Python has one as well. WebDriver works the same in all these different languages. It's just the APIs are, of course, going to be native for whatever that language is. <coughs> so, uh, WebDriver, like I said, will send web UI commands from the test automation code to the browser. Uh, it can handle every type of web interaction, whether that's a click, whether that's scraping text. Um, there's also a package called Appium, which is meant for mobile apps, and that you can even do the and just source as well. The swipes, the tags, all that stuff. Um, and as I said previously, the best practice is to make all web driver calls in page object methods. Right? We don't want our tests to be making explicit web driver low-level calls because that's going to become very repetitive. It's much better to say, hey, search page search, then search page find element, by name queue, wait for the thing to exist, send a click, wait for the page. We don't want to have that level of granularity. If you want to see the full documentation, uh, you, can, you, can, you can search it on DuckDuckGo, of course. But um, the Selenium Python, the read the docs, io, uh, or read the docs io, API, HTML, it's a lot of nicely palatable documentation out there that you can check out. All the calls are documented. So how do we use this? First, we need to install Selenium. Right? That's currently not installed in the project. But to install it, it's just a pithin d install. Pithin d install select. You'll also need that Chrome driver installed that is detailed in the instructions. Once you've got that in place, <coughs> there are some best practices we should keep in mind for web driver. Um, every test case should have its own web driver instance. Right? That means that in the setup of every test, we should create a new web driver instance that's going to open up our browser session. And at the end of that test case, we should shut it down. We don't want multiple tests to use that same web driver session because bad, scary things can happen. <laughs> things from one test can bleed over to another. That would break test case independence. And plus, I found, pragmatically, the longer web driver stays alive, the more of a chance there is for some random crazy breakage that has nothing to do with how good or bad the test code is, the tool itself may have some issues. And there may be environmental things going on in the system. So the lifespan of a web driver instance should be short. <coughs> For our solution, we're going to handle setup and cleanup with a PyTest fixture. Right? <coughs> Any test can use this fixture for setup and cleanup. Uh, always, always, always quit your web driver when a test is done. Uh, one of the biggest bugs you see within test automation code is that people don't quit their web driver, or a test fails or has an unexpected exception, and it doesn't go to the cleanup routine because they didn't handle that correctly. And next thing you know, you literally have zombie web driver processes and zombie Chrome processes crawling your machine, blocking your Jenkins directory, and you can't clean up, so you break down all of CI. <laughs> don't do that. Quit, and not close, because there's, there's a quit method and a close method. Always quit your web driver, that, that kills the whole thing. Close just closes the window, but doesn't necessarily kill the process. So yeah, avoid those zombies. Please, please no undeads running around like, oh, no. don't, right. don't block the pipeline, don't block the yes. Quit your web drivers. Yes. Personal experience, I've got some. Now you may ask, well, what kinds of web browsers can we automate, right? 
You can automate any major web browser. Selenium has support for Chrome, Firefox, IE, Edge, Safari, Opera, um, any of the big ones, there's support for it. Appium, the, the mobile app version of this all, same thing, all the different browsers are supported. Um, I believe in Selenium 4, they are mixing support for Opera. Um, most projects, and definitely within Selenium 4, NMTS is dead because NMTS has been dead. Uh, you can even do like headless Chrome and headless Firefox, which is really cool. <coughs> IE sucks no matter what, though. Just straight up, like, you want to do web UI test automation with IE, I'm sorry. It, 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 explicitly bad words is bad. Uh, <laughs> I'll call myself almost said something I shouldn't have. It, because, not because I hate IE, but because IE is slow. You cannot have more than one IE instance on a machine at a time running in parallels. Um, and it's just, it's bonkers weird from the others. Like all these play nice in the sandbox and you'll run the test on all of them and they pass and then IE is just like, nope. Anywho, um, all that to say, in theory, you can run on any browser. You just need different um, web, web driver instances. <coughs> so let's take a look at what setup and cleanup looks like in Python. With PyTest, it's beautifully simple. I love it. So we want to import PyTest as our module, and we want to import Selenium WebDriver as a, a module as well. Has anyone written a PyTest fixture before? Yeah, OK, so this might be a little bit new. Um, in more typical standard class-based test frameworks like unit test or JUnit, right? Every method is going to be a test test case, but then you also have like a setup and a cleanup method as well. Fixtures are like setup and cleanup methods combined. It's beautiful. What we're going to do is we're going to have a function that will do both setup and cleanup. We define it with pytest fixture as our marking or our annotation. <coughs> I'm going to call our fixture browser because this is what we're doing. We're setting up a browser to get ready for testing. To instantiate your browser, you simply call whatever browser type you want. So Selenium WebDriver, we're going to use Chrome. So I'm going to in initialize a Chrome instance. There's Firefox, IE, all the different ones. Right? And I'm going to store that in a variable, B. This B variable now has the WebDriver instance. As soon as this call happens, what's going to happen on the machine under test is if your paths are all lined up with Chrome driver, it's going to pop up with a, an empty Chrome browser session. You're going to see it. It's going to be boom in your face. Right? Awesome, right? What we then want to do is we want to set some configuration for the browser. Right? There's a bunch of options you can do. I'm not going to get into that because there are reasons or different configs you may or may not want to do for things, such as like headless or whatever. But one thing we're going to do for simplicity is we're going to set an implicit wait of 10 seconds. This is important. With web UI testing, you always have to wait for the page to load and be ready. Right? If you try to click an element before it exists, what's going to happen? Kaboom! Your test is going to blow because the element doesn't exist. You get an exception. That's really bad. We need to wait for the, the elements to exist before we can interact with them. Now, there's two ways you can do that. You can explicitly wait for every single element before you send the click or send the keys. Or you can be lazy. And for the sake of our simple example, laziness is fine. You can set this property to say, hey, no matter what, always wait up to 10 seconds before uh, the for an element to exist before sending an interaction. And if it doesn't exist after 10 seconds, then then and only then will I, uh, I throw an exception that it didn't exist. So that way we have a little bit of time up in there, right? An implicit way to make sure that my elements appear before I try to do stuff. That right there is one of the main reasons why web UI test automation is called flaky, is because people don't wait appropriately, right? Developers say, oh, these tests are flaky, they're always failing. Sometimes they pass, sometimes they fail, we should cut them. Usually it's because waiting is not happening. So always, always have some form of waiting. Finally, once we set up our browser, this is kind of like the setup portion of our picture, we're going to yield that result. Who knows what the yield command in Python does? Anybody? Has anybody seen this before? <laughs> the magic word, generator, right? Yield sets up a generator. So as the gentleman here in the front said, 
it's going to return the first thing. It's going to be like you're going to make a list of things, like the two different questions. So what we're going to do is here, this fixture is actually going to be a generator. So we're, we're going to, for the first phase of the fixture being executed, we're going to yield the value of the browser. So I've done the setup. That happens before the test case is run, and we'll see how that factors in. It's going to return the reference to the browser, so the test case can get that as like the result of the setup portion. Then everything after yield is going to be the cleanup portion. So after the test completes, it's going to come back into here and do these other steps. And so what's the final thing we do? Why? So we clean up. So we kill the zombies. Yes. <laughs> so we clean up. Exactly. Does this make sense? Yeah. Yep. Yep. This is a, I love PyTest. One of the reasons why they're beautiful. This is great. This, this is so much more scalable and shareable for your set of cleanup operations. It's always be great. So let's see how this factors into our test case. With any PyTest test function, if I declare a fixture by name as an argument, that means the fixture is automatically going to get called. That's how the magic works. So when this test is run now, because I've declared the browser fixture, it matches my name and says, ah, browser, you want that as a fixture for an input? I've got a browser fixture. Let me run the first part of that. It runs it, it initializes the web driver, it yields the browser object, and passes it in as an argument to this function. So now, my test function can use the browser object. And once this test function is done, we'll say, oh, I've got to clean up that fixture. It goes back in, does the generator second portion. Boom, no more zombies, it's quit, it's good, and we move on to the next test, or we end with a suite. Now that I have my browser, one thing I'll need to do, though, is I need to now update my page objects, because my page objects need a reference to this browser. Right, because the page objects are what's going to be calling Selenium Web Driver's calls, therefore they need reference to the Selenium Web Driver instance, so we have to pass it in. And it's boom, boom. Which means we need to go back to our page object stubs and add Gunder init methods our quasi-constructors in Python. <coughs> Simple thing though, we pass in a browser and we set that as a property. Cool, so now our page objects will have it as well. So let's make that real. Uh, part three, tutorial instructions. We will add that fixture and then update our page object classes. So give that a try, let's take up to eight minutes. Um, and let me know if you get stuck. Are there any questions at this point? Anybody? Okay, cool. Can you install the Chrome or just the Chrome? Sorry, what? Do we need to install Chrome? I mean, the Chrome driver? Yes, so you'll need to have Chrome as a browser on your machine as well as the Chrome driver executable. Okay. And we go through Pitfall? No, no, no. There were instructions for getting Chrome driver. You basically go to the Chrome driver website, you download it as an executable, and then you just put that on your pad and you make sure it's. Yeah, you change the permission so it is accessible. And then it, once it's on your path, that's all you need to do.
that's okay. These are these are hurdles we get over. It's not impossible. Just things we got to learn all the way. Yeah,
I'm going to try to condense this, the, the main highlights of what you need to know in the next five minutes. But if you ever need to go to the docs to learn more fine-grained granularly what is going on, this is a great resource. <coughs> so some of the calls with Selenium WebDriver are actually very simple. One-liners, some of them are just properties, but not even uh, method calls. Let's take a look at how we would implement some of those for our page objects. For example, on the search page, if you remember, we had that load method. The load method is supposed to load the web page in the browser. This is a very simple call. <coughs> Self.browser, because remember, we passed it into the page objects. Dot get, whatever my URL is. The get method will load a web page based on its URL. I like to make my URLs as uh, class variables, right? So they can be shared. They're kind of constants. <laughs> Python doesn't really have constants. OK, that's cool. Um, if this were, let's say, Java or C Sharp, I'd be making these constants. I'd be making these constant strings um, because the URL should change, right? But get whatever the URL is. Boom. That's all we need to do. It's easy. Python is awesome. <coughs> How about the title? Uh, if you remember, in the results page, we're supposed to return the title of whatever the page is. Title is nothing more than a property of browser objects, right? So I can say self.browser.title and return that. Easy, right? Basically, the moral of the story is if there's something you think you need on a web page, you go to the document, you, you control F for what you think the word might be, and eventually you'll hit it, you'll see the spec for it, and then you go make that happen. Ta-da! Great. Some are more complicated, right? And the more complicated ones are going to be interactions that deal specifically with web elements. Now, when I say web element, I'm referring to the individual things on the page. All the links, all of the headers, all of the divs, all of the, uh, all the text, right? All of those are web elements coded in HTML, pretty up with CSS, and possibly magic going on with JavaScript, right? What we're interested in, though, are knowing the HTML structure so we can locate those elements, so we can send interactions to those elements. And there's an art to that more than a science. So <coughs> let's look at how we would actually go about interacting with the search input for getting <coughs> a search phrase. Right? As you can see, it's more complicated. Shucks. We can still do it. It's not too bad. So first of all, in my search method, <coughs> What I need to do is I need to get that search input element. Right? And this is what we call element locating. My browser call is going to be browser.findElement, singular. I want to find one element that will be my search input. And the findElement method takes two arguments. It takes a locator type, and it takes a locator query. Now, what I like to do with my page objects, I like to separate concerns. I will write my locators as class variables or tuples at the class level. And I would name them in screaming case so people know, don't change these values. So my search input is something I'm going to locate by name, name being an HTML attribute of that element. And the name of that search input is Q. How did I know that? If you do an inspection of the HTML source code, and you look at that, that input element, you'll find that there is a, a name attribute that's value is Q. Right. Now, how did I know how to do that? We'll briefly talk about that in a slide or two, and I'll give you resources, because that in and of itself is another tutorial. <laughs> Web element locating is a tutorial in and of itself. <laughs> but trust me on this that this works. I have a name locator by Q. And what I'm doing here, rather than hard coding those values in, I'm setting it up here so that if there are other methods that need to use the same uh, locators, I can reuse them. And plus, this is a little bit more readable. Self browser, find element for search input versus find an element by name Q. Having that, that self documenting code to say I name what this element locator is is a bit more readable and helpful to me, I think. Right? This asterisk, if you haven't seen this operator before in Python, all it does is it takes a tuple and expands it out for arguments. So that's, that's all the magic that's going on there. Once I have my search input element, this search input object is a representing a web element, I can then send commands to that. So 
I, what do I want to do? I want to say search input dot send keys. That means type something at the keyboard. And what do I want to type? I want to type whatever the, the, the search phrase is, the word panda. And then I'm also going to add on the return key. Enter. Bang. Why? Because when I type a phrase and hit enter, what does it do? It submits that form. Does that make sense? So I had to locate an element using a locator that I've prescribed and then do stuff to it. Right? Locate, then interact. That's basically the pattern you have. What we didn't have to do explicitly here was wait for this to exist. Why? If you recall in our picture, we have an implicitly wait. So if this page is still loading, while it gets to this call, Selenium WebDriver will smartly wait for this element to be ready, up to 10 seconds, and then finally, once it's ready, then it'll, it'll find it, boom, and then click. <coughs> sort of that safety factor in there. <coughs> <coughs> Likewise, not only can I send interactions to elements, but I can also query state from elements. If there's some text on the page I want to get, I can scrape that. So here in my DuckDuckGo result page, again, I've got the same search input element, it's the same locator, and I still have to find it. But now what I want to do when I get the search input value, I don't want to send anything to it, I want to get whatever that value is. So I'm going to return search input dot get attribute named value. In the HTML, there is a value attribute, and that's going to have whatever is in the contents of that input. That's going to return it so that I can use it for my assertion in my test case. Is so everybody with me here? Cool. <clears throat> now, like I said, there are locators in and of themselves for our entire tutorial. Um, I highly recommend if you want to learn more about web UI testing and automation, I have developed a free course online. It's video based and it has a uh, um, transcript and it has um, little quizzes you can take at the end. It's on Test Automation University. It's called Web Element Locator Strategies. Free, online, take it. It's, I think it's pretty cool because it literally covers all these different kinds of locators and it shows you how you can go into Chrome's dev tools and inspect and come up with not just any locators, but good locators. Locators that will be robust. Because one of the other common things that happens with Test Automation is that you write your locators poorly, something in the product changes, and then kaboom, your tests fail because those elements can't be located anymore. Right. Those, you want to write the best locators you can for the robustness of your tests. So the different locator types, ones that I typically rely on, would be things like ID, class name, CSS selector, and XPath, right, in that order. Uh, name I'll use if it's convenient, like I did here in the example. <coughs> I try to stay away from XPath when I can because it's a little bit complicated. I don't know how many of y'all have played with XPaths before. Maybe some. They're not, they're not bad, but they're just a little bit more complicated, right? And simple is better than complex, complex is better than right? I try to stay away from tag name because that was really kind of useful. It's like, hey, I want to get all the eight elements on the page. But um, definitely take this course if you want to learn more. Um, you can learn, yes. No, I was going to say, when you do the buy ID, there's a, some of the testers that I've worked with that say when you use frameworks like ExtJS, some of the other ones that dynamically generate things, mm -hmm. you can't do IDs because the yep. IDs constantly are changing. Yep. In so that case, as ugly as that <coughs> is, sometimes that's the only thing that consistent yep. you have. Yep. Exactly. I frequently fall back on XMAP, um, specifically for things like uh, if you need to match based on text because of class names, or if you need to do hard indexing, right? Sometimes you have no choice. XPath can uniquely identify anything on the page. The others, there's no guarantee. <laughs> so, words to the wise. <laughs> All right, and as I said, typically my workflow is when I'm at the point where now I need to find web elements, I'll open up uh, DevTools in Chrome if you right click and go to inspect, you'll get this beautiful window. It has all the networking stuff, the console logs, it has the source code for the elements. And what's really nice is that you can hover over any element on the page and it will then synchronously highlight where in the source code of the page, in the HTML, that element appears. And so what I'll do is I'll find the element I want, 
I'll look at the HTML code, make the CSS classes and such, and try to figure out what would be the best locator based on what I know from locator strategies, and I'll use that in my test location. Like I said, I don't have enough time in this tutorial to cover writing good locators, but please, if you want to learn more, go to that course over the couple. And here's just a list of some very common web driver calls that you might find useful without having to go plunge the documents. Just want to put them in y'all's space so you can be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. So for the web driver instance itself, that browser object, uh, you can get the current URL. You can call find element to get one element. You can find elements to get all elements that match locator query and return that to the list. Right? You can, there are helper methods, find element by something, such as you can call find element by name, find element by ID, find element by XPath. I prefer the more generic find elements because of the pattern I showed you before with defining your locators as separate and then using that asterisk to expand them. What's nice about that is that when your locators change, if you need to change locator type, then you don't need to change your Python call, you just need to update the locator itself. So it's a little more robust in terms of code. Get gets the uh, get navigates to a URL. You can maximize the window. You can quit the browser. You can refresh the browser. You can save a screenshot. That's really cool. It's a PNG, JPEG. You can get a title. Specifically for web elements, after you have found them, you can send interactions like clearing the text, clicking from one element. You can find sub elements. Uh, you can get HTML attributes and properties. You can check if an element is displayed. That's different from whether or not it exists on the page. Right? Elements can exist in the page without actually being in appearance. You can get the pixel location, you can send keystrokes, you can get the pixel size, and you can also script whatever text is in the elements. So all very common things that most people end up doing with web elements and web elements. So it's 10 minutes to five. <coughs> we have one more part of our hands-on instructions. Um, try to finish this as quickly as you can. Uh, I've given 60 minutes. If you've noticed the time increments and all that, it's not likely some of you noticed that. Uh, but please take some time. We'll wrap it up there. And then I have just a few more slides after that. And hopefully we can be done by like 5.10, 5.15. I don't want I don't want to push it too, too far. But uh, I want to get some time back from what we lost for a week. So yeah, have at it. Let me know if you get stuck. And good times.
let it, let it update and then rerun it. Because they're, they're just, one of the most frustrating. Yeah, one of the most frustrating things about this kind of setup is like <laughs> browsers update and the browser executable updates and they can fall out of sync. Most of the times they're they're compatible with a few version numbers of each other. Sometimes they're not. Sorry. <laughs> About like two or three months ago, there was a big issue where everybody got wiped out because I think it was either Chrome 74 or 75 said, no, nope, we're going to be completely incompatible with everything else before. And everybody's like, it okay, could have told us. But yeah. that was not a fun day at my job. So I'm like, why is, why is every test failing? Because <laughs> oh, so, uh, Chrome automatically updated all the sum nodes. And all I just don't see how. So, even some of the bigger companies need to listen to Amazon. <laughs> How do their pages work? They must just have machines of just every version for our version. <laughs> Combinations of machines and have no way to do nothing with mm -hmm. testing. Because mm -hmm. uh, it, it's worth it for them. As opposed to me, they go, yeah, this is the browser we support. We'll, we'll talk about multi browser testing. <coughs> but yeah, the, the sheer scale of some companies for what they have to support, and they not just desktop browsers, but mobile. It's a place of the, the phones are just broke, and, and they're even. Phones are trickier to automate, and there are way more variations that you have to work on. Oh, yeah. That's the of a whole thing. So what we <coughs> what I said before about a risk-based approach, you have to be picky and choosing the resources you have. Right. Now, a lot of it depends on your market. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're somebody like Amazon, you want it to work with every freaking possible device Going back to what they could work on. Yeah. You know, if you're an internal in a company, mm -hmm. they usually have here's the standard things we're going to use, and they don't upgrade. Yeah, so I work for a, a small company called Precision Lender. They make a web app that helps bankers make smart phones. So our customers are Macs. So basically, it's our, our testing configuration is Chrome and IE 11 on Windows. No mobile, tablet, <laughs> no other browsers, no other operating systems. It's just Chrome and IE 11, so it's easy. But yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it's a huge concern because you want to also run your test such that it could run theoretically on any configuration. Right now, well, it works on any configuration on the thing, but the test is shown. The nice thing is, if you can get something in your slaves to set up, you, in theory, could just swap into the browser. And that's it. And I can, you might get to the situation where you're a 90%, but you'll also identify <coughs> that which is compatible. And then you might be able to look at it and say, why? Is that where I have to start putting in code that says, if this is your browser, that, that's your browser. It is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the pain of code. I think somebody else is giving a talk to you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there was another talk to you, because you're saying, like, if, if this browser, somebody gave a talk, Ali, his talk was. Oh, yeah, the, if, if the code's not. Oh, yeah, because you don't want to. You don't want to do that because you end up, okay, if it's this, oh, but there's these three lines that are the same in this one and this one, so I really want to pull them out and make a method. Oh, but yeah, but now that maybe there's a slightly different way each one of those lines is done, so they're not really the same. Oh, well, maybe I'll pick that method that has the browser and, and it just cascades. Mm -hmm. it's, How how far along is everybody? Do people get it working? 
proposals? Need a few more minutes? Pass? Awesome. You saw some other hands. So raise your hand if you have it passing in market. So I'll give another minute or two, and then we'll just have to move on because I saw somebody waving out the door out there. So, um, but because you have all the instructions and you even have extra activities you can do afterwards independently, um, feel free to take this home and try more. Try more tests. I'm planning to be there, but I may have to be This is a great start for us. Yeah, and if you want to go back and start, by the way, you all are welcome to come to the Sprints down at 711 North High Street. Uh, there's a registra registration thing for us, just so we know. Actually, by this point, it's to just come. <laughs> um, we've already figured out how much pizza we're going to order, period. Great. There's free pizza, beverages, adult beverages, and outlet strips, Wi-Fi. This is work on this. Great. Yeah. 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 So, um, that being said, let's. If, if you haven't finished as of this moment, let's pause. Let me finish up just a few handful of slides I've got left, and then we can call it done. Go have a potty break, and then go see lightning clubs before we go eat pizza and work on this board. Yeah, boom, sweet. Okay. Cool. So ultimately, what you want is something that looks like this. You have your one web test passing. You should have seen Chrome come up, do the dance, do the, 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 the searching, get verified, and then close. It probably only takes about five to 10 seconds. Uh, more rigorous tests at the industry level are probably going to take more like 30 seconds to a minute. So this one is you know, small and condensed. This also. So um, as gentleman here was saying, right, this is a great starter project. Right? We, we have written one test in two hours. And though you may think that is kind of slow, we've done it with a very methodical approach with good design principles the whole way. So we can repeat that for other kinds of tests. In fact, I've given homework assignments in there for your own amusement, if you so choose, to have some more ideas for test script writing in Start.co. But moreover, if you wanted to, you could lift this solution code base and use it for any other kind of web UI test. Let's say at your company, on your team, you want to start doing some web UI testing for whatever web app you've got, or maybe you've got a microservice framework that you need to test at the REST API level, right? You can take the basis of what we've done and apply it with new domains of the test. So let's talk about some ways we can just kind of stretch the solution even further to go from cool tutorial starter project to industry grade awesomeness. First of all, the multiple browser problem. We were just chatting about that, right? Web UI tests, in theory, should run on any browser, right? <coughs> the browser choice itself should be an input to your automation system. You don't want to hard code browser choices. My recommendation, put them in a config file, along with any other inputs you need, like usernames, passwords, secrets, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I like to use JSON. Why? Because it's a one-line call in Python to load a JSON file into a dictionary. Beautiful. And you get hierarchy, right? And then you can read that config file in using fixtures, right? Here, I could have hacked up my browser fixture to read the um, configuration file, and then based on my browser choice, I know I'm using if else's, whatever. But I could say if to configure the browser is Chrome, then I instantiate Chrome. Else if it's Firefox, I instantiate Firefox, so on and so forth, right? So this is a way that I can handle inputs to my automation system, namely of which being browser choice. <coughs> now, of course, your config will need to set up for the different browsers. Firefox driver and all that stuff, but this will be the code side. Another thing to consider is parallel execution. Make no joke about it, web UI tests are slow. The one you have is pretty fast because it's fairly small. Right? I work at a company where every night we run 1,500 web UI tests. And in parallel three times, it takes about an hour to an hour and a half times three different runs to get it all through. Right? We're talking hours and hours of testing for, honestly, for this magnitude of our app, not that much coverage. You've got to run parallel to shrink that down. So you can use PyTest Exodus as an extension to PyTest. It's a plugin for parallel execution, makes it easy. Um, you can also use Selenium Grid for distributing your web drivers out remotely. 
Today, all of your web drivers were running on your laptops. Right? Imagine if you had a cluster that you could just request as a service, hey, give me a web driver that's Chrome on Windows of these versions, and it would give it to you. And imagine that if you could scale this thing up out the wazoo, it'd have maybe dozens to hundreds of tests running in parallel at a time, so you go from hours to minutes. Selenium, uh, Selenium group can enable that. That's what I'm currently working on at my day job. <laughs> explicit weights. We talked a little bit about that, implicit versus explicit. Um, implicitly waiting up to 10 seconds may not be the best for a large scale project. You may have to look, use explicit weights for more precise timings and conditions because not everything in your app will be done in 10 seconds. Maybe some things take longer, so you need to tune that. Um, most interactions will need to target elements to exist in the DOM, so that could be a precondition. Um, sometimes you need to make sure that not only do they exist, but they also appear, meaning they're displayed. Um, a lot of this stuff you should be putting in page object methods. Why? So you get the reusability. So just keep that in mind. Furthermore, I've, I've said very, very good things about page objects. I'm actually not a big believer in the page object pattern. <gasps> Shocking, I know, right? Crazy. Well, hear me out. Page objects are great. Um, they're, they're easy to set up and get going. Anybody with just basic object-oriented programming skills can understand how a page object works. The only problem is, as you start to scale up to the tune of hundreds to thousands of tests, page objects are not very scalable in terms of development. Um, in terms of development, right? Because people end up just shoving more locators and more methods, and then you have these monolithic classes that get huge, and you don't always refactor them. Um, there are some ways you can help mitigate this. Um, you might make a super class for page objects for common methods. Um, you might have some helper methods for common operations. Um, maybe some logging could help. Personally, what I prefer to use is a different pattern. It's called screenplay pattern. It's a bit more complicated <coughs> than itself as its own tutorial. Um, and it is a bit more complicated, but it, it mitigates a lot of these other issues. Currently, I am working on a Pythonic implementation of the screenplay pattern that I hope to release in open source sometime this year. <laughs> so maybe that could be another tutorial conference talk in the future. Um, and finally, to conclude, with a million dollar question, before you start, go off, start going off and making a whole bunch of web tests, ask yourself, should the thing I think I should be testing, should it be a web UI test? Or can I push it down the pyramid? Right? Always keep that in mind. Should this particular test really be a web test? A web UI test, or should it be maybe a lower level, a service level, maybe a user test? Because web UI testing is expensive. Focus on return on investment. So, I know we're fast out of time. I know we got off to a slow start, but congratulations! You made it. You finished the tutorial. Thank you all for being here. This was great. I hope you all learned a lot. I hope this was fun and not boring. I hope that you all can go and do amazing things with us. Um, <laughs> The homework, if you so choose, do the independent exercises. Get your test running with Selenium Web Driver, do the independent exercises. Um, if you want to take a picture of any slide, this is the one. Here are more resources for learning. Uh, test Automation University has some great courses on this. Uh, test, I recently just did a full tutorial as a blog series with testproject.io. And then of course, my blog at automationpanda.com. Uh, I've got lots of resources out there. You can reach out to me on Twitter at automationpanda. There's a contact form at automationpanda.com. If I don't see you tonight, but you still need help, just send me a message. I'll, I'll try to get to you as soon as I can. So thank you all. Happy Pi Ohio. Let's go to lightning talks. Woo! Woo! We did it! <laughs>